sometimes I can cleverly hide that I film out of order, but because of the fact that I chopped all my hair before filming this introduction, you can definitely tell that my hair is significantly longer during all of this, so hello i am really really excited to talk about the booker lawn prize today i have really enjoyed reading these books last year i joined a little late so i didn't get the whole experience so this was delightful i have read four books in this blog and all of them had unexpected surprises thoughts some of them i went from absolutely hating to adoring some of them i could write essays about and i don't know if i want to and some i you know, turned around and didn't like things in the end. So during this video, I'm going to be reading first Booth. It is about this family who is surrounding John Wilkes Booth and his famous interaction with Lincoln. And throughout this, we see how his family is developed before he is born, how tragedy and immigration and the ways in which they have their stories in theater and mental health and all of these things different interact in such interesting and beautiful ways. And we also see little sparks of history and how that is developing and how Lincoln's life is developing it is not John Wilkes' story, but really about the impact of how people who have traumatic things that happen in their life are impacted by this. And then I read Glory, which is a really interesting meditation on war, on revolution, on propaganda. It is really interesting in the way that it does that. And I will have so many thoughts in this vlog about it because I definitely went back and forth on how I felt on it. And we'll see how I ended in the end. And then following from that, I read Trust by Hernan. Diaz and I had an experience as well. I knew nothing going into it and I think that was the best possible thing. There was a lot of spoilers even just in general reviews and I think not knowing that allowed me to be really intrigued because I had no idea which narrator was coming next, what was going on, and I had such a delightful time reading this and you will see all of my like guesses, thoughts, outrages throughout this and then last and probably least, but interestingly enough, I read O. William by Elizabeth Stroud. I had previously read her two other books in the series, which follows Lucy Barden. She is a woman who is in her 60s and she's looking back at her life. We have a very impersonal tone and kind of conversational. It is realistic to the realistic way, just the way that people talk, not dramatized. It does deal with heavy topics, but never in a nuanced or pointed way. It's just like, and that's there. And I did think this was interesting from the other one, and I think that reading the first one and the short stories gave me a greater appreciation for Elizabeth Strout as an author. So I'm really, really excited to talk about these in more depth throughout it. The only one I read so far is small things like these, which I read back in January and I really loved. So I'm hoping that everything else will live up to there and I will get to read some of the other books before the prize is announced. So I'm about a quarter of the way through Booth and I'm really, really loving it. I was like, doubting it and then I was like maybe I won't enjoy this and then from like the first paragraph I was really really in love. It does omniscient and tells lots of stories. It starts with Rosemary, one of his older sisters, and just allows the story of her going. Now we get to Edwin, which I'm not liking as much, but I really really love Rosemary and she's really interesting and I'm really learning so much about it and it's just really really delightful and I really love the narration and writing style and the narrative voice. Omniscient narration is always going to be one of my favorites and I think this is delightfully and brilliantly done with lyricalness but like exactness and it talks about slavery and things like that but also calls it out when also recognizing that the characters in the stories don't have perfect views on that and like especially about like Junius Booth, the father who like you know morally kind of disagrees with slavery on principle but you know when he's poor and stuff uses slaves and he rents slaves and then says that he's gonna release them after five years and stuff well his father is much more committed to that and like spends a lot of time helping people escape as well as you know holding up money for them so it shows the hypocrisy in both of them that they allow slaves to work their land while also being opposed to it but also paying but not paying as much as they would for other labor it's a very convoluted way in a way that things are not just black and white in the way that we look at historical it's interesting looking back i like you know, googled him and he like was a confederate sympathizer and that's why he killed Lincoln. Interested to see how he goes from a family that is technically morally opposed to slavery even though they sometimes employ it versus one who would kill Lincoln for trying to abolish it. And I'm interested in how that will work out and how that happens but it is also a huge thing at this story. They have gone from living in the country to living in a city and I'm not sure if that will change the way that they view it and how their belief systems change but I'm interested in seeing the different point of view from the different booths and now we're getting a little bit of Lincoln's backstory and stuff which is interesting as well and I'm really really excited for this and to read all these books. I finished Booth last night and I really really loved it. It was just really marvelous. I really enjoyed the social commentary. I really enjoyed the characters. I fell in love with Family Rosie was the most constructive but also really brilliant and fun and I like that he didn't center on John but like the ramifications on his family and the author note where it talks about on January 6th the confederate flag was in the White House for the first time and let us 
never stand to have that happen again. I'm not American, and I don't know much about American history, but I found it very powerful and also very personal. Like, it does a very good job of looking at personal things and how they interact with things. Like, it's not really the story about the Civil War, but it is has that in the background and how people get radicalized and feel connected and about just family in general and I really liked it and I'm currently three hours into Glory and it's interesting. I was a little off taken and I think that like it's supposed to be like an animal farm but I don't think it's necessarily aided by having animals other than the fact that we have a dissociation from like the real thing. Like it's very clearly taking very heavily on the Zimbabwean revolution and the only way that you can not see that or like, I don't know, have some room to wiggle and consider things maybe different from what you've heard is by making them animals. I don't think it's aided, there's not really a huge commentary about the actual animals, but I think that it, it is affected by distancing you enough to have a conversation where you're not thinking about this history or the isn't history. And I'm currently on my route to Ottawa because my sister-in-law just went into labor, so this is going to be a road trip vlog now, and I'm excited for that. So I don't know if I've ever been so tired. I uh, did not appreciate taking three and a half hours to cross Toronto, which should take about an hour and a half. If, you know, if the traffic's real good and there's like nothing and driving at light, it might take an hour and 15 to like get there. And it's taken three and a half hours <laughs> because it was a Friday. So I was in a lot of chronic pain before I started, but you know, nephews are worth it. This is my fourth nephew. I'm very, very excited. I read more of Glory. I think it's very hampered by not having a protagonist which is funny because that's something that i said that booth really didn't need a protagonist but the protagonist was the family i don't think i know enough about zimbabwe and revolution and culture and stuff to get all of it without a center point and it was very interesting and i've read a little bit about the first couple and the people that it's based on but i'm still struggling enough to feel any emotion and I think that I, I do tend, like, it has a lot of quotations and stuff, and I think I tend to prefer something like Booth if that goes, like, the overall events and the prose and the feelings rather than, like, the exact words. Especially for something that I don't have a lot of reference points for, like, I think I need more historical knowledge. And it is still strange for me that, like, you're mentioning, like, Christianity and God and quoting from the Bible and mentioning iPhones and, you know, the West and Britain and Africa while also having a fake country with animals. Like, I feel like... It, it does make it harder to be an allegory when you have so many things that are true and but I understand that it, it creates a needing distance currently we're in a section I'm not sure exactly how she's related but she is a goat and she's come back I thought that she was originally the first mother's daughter but I don't think she is but it, her story is interesting and stuff like that but it is it is very distanced in the way that it's telling it too like in just in general we aren't hearing a lot of the thoughts and feelings. It is funny and it is poignant in places and it's very political, which I love, but I, I feel like I haven't found a grounding point to center myself on and I'm struggling with it because of that. Like I think I, I think I need a little bit more to be able to focus on and to be able to hold on to so that everything around it makes sense. So um, we hit more traffic and uh, we are currently further than it takes to get to Ottawa and I am still <laughs> two and a half hours away. <laughs> I hate Friday driving so much with such a passion. I always leave on Thursdays for this very reason, but still no baby, still no end of the book. I have started listening to the radio. Coffee was closed, so I couldn't get coffee. So instead I got two energy drinks for the same price and I have drank one and a half and I am just bumping. It has gone past boredom, past exhaustion to just hyperactivity and I have reading more of the book. I really like the line. So I was interesting the first lady who's a donkey. I've been like kind of ishy on how she's being represented and stuff. But we got into the aspect where like a lot of people are like, well, you know, the, the country was already crap before she came in because she married him later in life. And, you know, a lot of the times we blame women when, you know, the men because we don't want to blame the men. And I thought that line was great and really redeemed how I thought because I wasn't sure if like the way it's sometimes hard to tell what is satirical and what is opinions bleeding in and stuff especially since she's characterized as a donkey which isn't definitely the most and her husband is a horse and just the the way and the things and yeah i am starting to laugh at the like what is it like free uncriminalized elections and stuff like free credible elections hashtag free credible elections and it's it's not funny but it has become funny to me I finished Glory and I really liked it in the end. I'm surprised by how much I liked it. I think Destiny's story really, really brought it up and I just felt really connected to the characters and a lot of the threads came together. I understood it more and the emotion. I think the repetition really, really worked for me and the way that we allowed the characters to come into their own and to say things I can't breathe over and over and over, take, 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 take over and over and over again. And so many of these themes really were shown 
we talked about genocide and we repeated all of the names and it said this person and this person and this person and and it shows the way that families are distracted by it and it talked about intergenerational trauma and the way that that affected families and I just really liked it in the way I really hope I get to reread it again it has ridiculously long things on the library I really really loved it it's a book I think I could read and physically annotate so it's interesting to go from beginning where I was very skeptical to an end where I really really enjoyed it and yeah I'll give a more fuller review later on I think I'm gonna read trust next on my way home and I got it very early I had like eight weeks left and then it suddenly showed up so I hope that happens for more of my book list but it just made me so happy and I can't read to read that and I also have a William and I will check in with both of them sorry if it is ridiculously loud because it is thundering and pouring outside right now but I am currently on my way home I had a lovely time meeting my nephew which was just delightful and catching up with many of my family and that was just lovely and I am continuing on the booker list trust is interesting I am about an hour out of 10 hours in and I'm curious to it. It was one of the ones I was most hesitant and then I saw a really good review from Bob the Booker and that made me think it, I could like it after all because it is looking at trust funds and trusting people and so far we've looked at one guy who was born to these families and he's like more quiet when his parents who are like cigarillo and cigarette like, he's not really a huge fan of that and he ends up going more into wall street after he's orphaned at a young age now we're also following helen who i think they're going to get married and then we're going to follow their child and we're getting her backstory it is at least my hypothesis on this and because it's mentioned briefly that she will meet her husband and currently her father wants to educate her and he kind of goes down the mystic, which is very big. It's set right before World War One, and that seems to be like where the height of where you either look at like even like Arthur Conan Doyle was kind of big into that. Some of the other people who were major in that day, Rasputin is very famous for that, but there's a lot of mythicism going on in this era. And she's been traveling in Europe. Her mother is very good at being a socialite, very good at making people feel welcome. I think it said she has the talent of making everyone feel like they're a good conversationalist and she is bringing up her wits at this point and I think we're going to be going into that advantageous marriage so I'm really excited to see that and I'm liking the characters so far I would love to see more of them and like but I hope that it's multi-generational I'm liking Helen especially right now and I hope that I get to see her grow old maybe I'll see her middle aged and then older and then like how she transforms throughout her life I would really like to see that so I'm only a third into this book and I am already devastated I got goosebumps and stuff because we started talking about mental health and then we started talking about mental health in world war one era or like 1920s it was not good i guess 1930s i just i as someone who has a background in mental health and like you know also knows how the 20th century she did it i just started like bristling and then it happened and it got worse and worse and worse and now i just feel sadness and i'm only a third way through this book and like I'm not sure how all of the pieces are connected because we kind of ended that story and moved on to another one where we're restarting someone's own ancestry and like their own things and now we're in the 1800s going back to like the 1930s but my heart is so broken for the characters in the first half that dealt with mental illness and the like terrible horrendous treatment that people who suffered from mental illness especially schizophrenia and things like that dealt with in that era and yeah, it just really, really broke my heart. I'm dealing with some death and stuff, and I don't know. I don't know if the rain or the already, like, hit of the mental health before. I just feel really devastated. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly the themes of this book because I get the ancestry, the trust, the things. Is it the devastation of, like, trying to put up money? And, like, there's a lot of conversation about what money, a lot of conversation about math. You know, we really saw Helen and Rask who had these personalities that were so quiet but were drawn together because they never had to atone for each other. And yeah, I'm interested in the way that this book comes together because I'm not, I'm seeing the themes but I'm not sure exactly what the themes are saying, like how they're going to connect and how the money and trust and like trust as in like trust fun as in money begotten money. Yeah, I'm interested in how that will come together and what message that will have. And yeah. <laughs> I'm just kind of sad. So I'm not sure I like this guy, but I like his wording of the sentence. I'm not given to flights of lyricism, but Mildred was my muse. And this guy seems almost counteracting Rask and Helen, but also complimenting them in some ways. We have Helen and Mildred who both grew up in Europe and have this story and then are brought back to New York where their husbands were 
and it is very interesting to see them and to see the way that mostly like we get a little bit of the cliff notes of Rask's life but we get a lot more of Helen. This one is told in first person rather than third person and I don't even know this dude's name but he's talking about Mildred and we know from the beginning that Mildred has died and he's talking about her in interesting way. Both her and Helen had this huge interest in literature and in languages and in art and they are patronesses and benefactors and very big into philanthropy and it's very interesting to see the way they had that and the ways that they dealt with different illnesses in their life and the way that there corresponds i don't want to get too spoilery but i'm interested in that but i'm also i'm not sure if it's humanizing or anti-humanizing with the way that we're viewing this dude and his narration. So it's first person, and often he has notes on like a page on Mildred's spirits, a page on Mildred's rapid decline, as mentioned in chapter three. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be coming off as him not being very lyrical and needing like notes on what he's saying and he's wanting to subscribe this, or it's supposed to come off as more calculated, especially since now he is defending a lot of the idea of antitrust funds, anti all of these things. He's really defending the fact that, you know, financiers are important and that there's like you know people view him and other people as you know taking advantage of people but they're actually really good and i think that this is kind of the core of the thing for him it's almost a defense of his thing and i'm not sure how much he's using his wife as a crutch to make him seem like a better person than he is and i'm really interested because they have not made any relation to them even though their grandparents seem to be involved in the same areas grew up in new york and then they spent similar times in Europe and in similar times in different places and got married at the same time. Neither of them have children. It's very interesting to see the disposition of these things and I really want to see how this one plays out. Even though I'm intrigued by it, I'm also so annoyed because I do not like him and I do not like his narration. So I am hoping that there is going to be three stories because it's about 10 hours and the first one was about three hours in a bit and then we'll all connect and have the theme but i don't know i was really hoping for like a multi-generational saga and it's not so i'm very intrigued to see how these stories come together and i think that it could be really powerful i also think it's interesting in the way that this corresponds with glory because you have these stories where you have these people saying despicable things and the novel doesn't critique it but it uses it as its own satirizing like it shows it allows you to parse through the destructive way that people are talking rather than holding your hand through that which is interesting i guess booth has a little bit of that too as well with its conversation on the ways that like the south talked about slavery and things like that where like black people couldn't be free and stuff so it's interesting how these have correspondence a few days ago i listened to eric anderson's review and conversation around the long list and what he wanted and i always love it because he critiques them and so far, these three all work very well together. And actually, in many ways, in small things like these works together, it has a political and that kind of disturbance and uneasiness and actual evil under these very common statements. I'm interested to read the rest of the long list to read many different books in this collection and see how they come together because these ones all seem to have that. I was literally pulling out the misogyny brought me back. Oh. So now he's going on about how women being involved in the stock system definitely showed the disaster. Like, I think the literal last quote that I listened to was at the beginning of the decade, women only brought up 10% and at the end, 40%. Could have there been a clearer destination that the disaster was near and that the mass hysteria was the closest thing to collective downfall? And it's talking about how, like, women have neglected their housework in order to dabble in stocks and how that is not something that a woman should do. So I'm thinking that, like, I don't know. His treatment of Mildred and her being the nice, like, dead woman that he can talk about and make himself sound like a better person is maybe not completely honest. I don't know. I don't like this dude, and I really hope that his chapters end soon because it's like, you know, it's sometimes real bad to listen to, a, like, a terrible person in third person, but to listen to them in first person is just grueling. I'm incredibly thankful that that third section was the shortest because the fourth section is my favorite so far and I think she's the most cleverest and most compelling of the narrator so far. It is the story of Ida. I'm not sure if there's any following this but there is some reveals, there's some connections, and I'm loving it and I cannot wait. A new aspect of the word trust and how that compares it to now. It also starts in 1981 and is looking back at someone who's younger and stuff and we get some more working class experience and how that's impacted by the great depression and it's just really intriguing and i'm really liking it and i can't wait for the finale it's a book that like 
the first section is really good and then the middle section is kind of confusing and then the payoff so far is really good and I'm not even near the end so I cannot wait for the final connection. I think it's going to be brilliant and there's going to be some huge reveals and things that I'm going to really like. So I think this is definitely a contender for a book that I really really love. So I finished Trust and I really really loved it. I really enjoyed the last aspects. Ida story was really interesting. I'm really glad that I knew nothing going into this because I think I was really surprised in really interesting ways that I would not have been if I had have known more or listened to more reviews and stuff because I really really enjoyed the ways that it looked at who tells your story, how your story is told, the stories that revolve around each other, and I just kept on guessing throughout. The last bit was the most insightful on some of the narrative things. It wasn't the most enjoyable for style for me, but it was very interesting to see the way that people were represented throughout the different narratives and how different people connected to different people and yeah I it is definitely a book that I hope to do a full review of I am going to finish a William and then I'm going to put this together I'm also going to have a predictions for the shortlist and I'll probably react to the shortlist as well so I'm really excited for this booker prize I love all the different themes between it the way that we have victims and women and the way they're represented way that political narratives and divisions are used against different characters in this, in Trust, in Glory, in Booth. All of these characters have the ways that different things are represented and I'm really enjoying the themes. So I went on a really really long walk today and I have been reading O William by Elizabeth Strout and it is interesting. I, I'm liking the way that it is doing the first book better. It is a bunch of little I'm really hoping that is not thunder about to go down, that would not be fun. There's a bunch of little like vignettes told about her story and how she reflects in life and it's very imperfect and very personal. It almost sounds like a memoir in the way that someone would talk and I don't think I love the conversational tone very much, like I don't think it's my biggest style, but I do find it very interesting in the way that it's done. I thought I was going to be all fancy and talk outside but I don't really want to be rained on and it is very, very thundery and dark now, but I'm enjoying it. I'm not enjoying the conversational tide. But I'm actually liking, I think I liked the second book and the intrigue in that a little bit better than Lucy's story, but I think that it's doing a lot better at what it's supposed to be doing with the conversational style. And it's reflecting on her marriage, on her things, and the way that she looks at relationships. And I'm finding that very interesting in the way that she talks about the things that we don't talk about and makes it important in the ways that we don't. It's very personal, but also it doesn't take nuance, like it doesn't take nuance. It doesn't allow you to get poignancy in the same way, which is very interesting. I think I'm finally coming to terms and love with Lucy. It is now three books and I'm, I'm glad that I've gone on this journey because the first one, it wasn't that I disliked it, like I think in another tone and another story I would have liked Lucy better. And even though it's been like a month, I'm actually kind of curious to go back and read the first one now that I have more information because she is much more of a rounded character who's given more things. And I especially like the second one, like the second one had a lot of issues because I think that in some ways the depictions were problematic and it bothered me in the ways that she did it but the characters were very compelling like I really really enjoyed the characters and their stories I just was uncomfortable with some of the ways that she dealt with things and the words she used and just it just it gave me it gave me a sense of an author who's trying to do well but is making mistakes because she's from a little bit of an older generation or maybe it's just that she's trying to capture older adults who like like, even now, Lucy reminds me so much of my grandmother, <laughs> even though Lucy, I think in this story, is in her 60s. So, like, she's much younger, my grandmother is in her 90s, but, like, it's just the, the way that elder people sometimes talk, like, it, it, it reminds me so much of that, like, that kind of, like, insulting... <sighs> See, now that I've said it was my grandmother, I feel like I can't critique her, but... <laughs> It's not my grandmother's way. It's just like the way that some people speak where they're like, oh yeah, like let's hear some gossip or let's talk about this. And it can definitely bother me or like they're talking about progressive things but in like a kind of awkward way. And I'm not sure if that's like Elizabeth Stroud. Like it could just be intentionally purposeful on her side that she's just creating characters that talk that way. Not like that she believes that way. But it's hard to know. I, I do really want to read all of Kitteridge right now. Or in the future because I really want to compare that. I love being able to read a large amount of people's work and be able to judge how those relate to them and I can definitely see her changing and I like Lucy more here and I, I it is weird because she's talking directly to the thing. She's like oh I'm not going to tell you this. Like she doesn't want to go into the stories of her family because they're hard to write and she already wrote a book about that and it's interesting here because she'll be like before I tell you about this I'm going to tell you this story about William 
and it's a story about like how she got stranded in Chicago and she had to take a train back because she just really wanted to see her family and she's like now I will tell you the story and it's not super related and that's kind of the way that we ourselves speak and I think that that is some of the things like I, I well I don't know because I really love slice of life but I also like slightly elevated slice of life but I think I'm warming up to this a little bit more I don't know it is really interesting and I wonder how I would take it if I was a woman in my 60s reading it versus you know a 25 year old reading it so I am very interested in that and I think I'm winning them over I still don't like want it to necessarily win the booker because like I just don't think that I don't know I don't want to say that it's not worthy of it but I think that like it does deal with a lot of things like it's dealing with age I love that all of these have followed characters that are you know older than 50 I think that that is really important to have that in literature but I also think that it's not dealing with as heavy topics or as complex issues as some of the other things. But on the other hand, do we sometimes lessen women's things? Like, do we sometimes marginalize or just sometimes just keep to the margin stories of older women aging and reflecting on life and on poverty and stuff like that? Do we not highlight those and thus not say they're important? But on the other hand, is it as important as the conversations in trust? Because trust is dealing with a lot of that as well, like the ways that women are brought to the side and aren't given as much things and are affected by money and stuff. It is one of the authors where I think I want to like read all of her work to analyze it, but I'm not sure I'm ever gonna like love her as an author. I don't think this would make my like shortlist hope or prediction, but I am glad I've read this. It's, it's been a nice journey. I still have a few hours left of the audiobook and then I will wrap this up. I had started writing all my reviews and then I totally got distracted by writing short stories, so yeah. I really liked Lucy. It made me think about a commentary story that I had because I've been trying to write short stories, so that's really exciting. I am hopefully going to write my predictions and stuff like that because we only have two days and I put the makeup on, so that means I have to film soon. I, I liked the first one, but I just I felt unfulfilled and kind of annoyed, and this one had so many less problematicness, which was so nice. I think it's because it was published last year. There was probably some more people being like, maybe you should include this or stuff like that. There was still some fat phobia that made me... Because again, like, she often uses these things, like, she doesn't necessarily treat people badly, but the ways and comparisons that she sometimes uses is, like, thing. Like, for instance, in one of the things, she's talking about how she feels very invisible and yet people see her, and how she always feels like this is marked. And then she talks about that with a person who is plus-sized and how he is marked by the world. And it just seems like, I don't know, maybe that's not really her right to talk about, and also like her description of him is not very kind. So even though she's saying, she's, I guess, kind of bringing attention to that phobia, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, it's not uncompassionate, but it's also not great. And she does that in a lot of her work where I'm like, hmm. And maybe that's also just supposed to be Lucy's point of view because I don't really read anything that wasn't from Lucy's point of view or meant to be kind of around Lucy's point of view. I'm really sad because as I've been looking through this, there are several books on here that will not be published before the shortlist, which, like, I've been, like, looking for them and trying to find them in the library, but I can't even buy them. Like, After Sappho, The Moons of Mali study, it's so many of these just, I cannot get access to them, even if I wanted to, and I'm really sad because they're the ones I was really, really sad for. Nightcrawling is one of the ones that is coming up, but I have six weeks left. Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies, I'm really excited as that's someone who has chronic pain to see that and to see the ways that it is and that one might get it because I think I still have 14 weeks. I'm really hoping that library gets more copies so I will be quicker on the list but I think I will read that after it is announced. We are at the end of the vlog again. My short hair is back. We are ended and I read all four of these books and they were very interesting. I think in ranking, in personal ranking, I don't know. I really enjoyed both Booth and Trust. I think Booth is probably the hype because I enjoyed it all the way through. I really enjoyed the characters. I've heard some people reflect that it is too long and you feel the length. I really like slow characters and I like the nuance. I like the reflection. I love omniscient narration. Like it worked for me so, so well. I think based on reviews and some people and there's more important things going on in some of the discussions, this is a book that might not make the long list. And that does actually disappoint me because I think that people are maybe not giving it a full shot. Like I think that I don't know. I think people want the scandal and the grandiose, but it's not really about that. It's about the way that families are affected. And I really enjoy the aspects of like parentification and the way that that dealt. Like that is such a big issue that never gets talked about, which is the phenomenon of a child taking on the role of a parent for a parent. And this is so evident in the Booth family. It's very evident in the way the dysfunction in the family, the way that things happen 
whether it's the father or the mother and how Rosalie and Edwin and the different characters really take this on and how it affects it. It's very interesting. I really enjoyed the conversations on slavery and radicalization and the ways in which all of them ended up so union and the ways that he became confederate because there was a different development. He went to a southern elite boarding school and how that impacted him and also how the stories of how the men said that they were against slavery and yet utilized slavery when they did and what does it mean to be complacent because grandfather richard was more complacent he was also very active in pe letting people go so his complacency in the system was more of a disguise for his actual advocacy when junius was more of just a man who liked having high morals liked being the thing but didn't actually always act in them and i think that his consistency is very different in others and i think that it's a great reflection on grief and on parenthood on family dynamics and the ways in which we're impacted like i think it's such a great book and i think that it like it does a lot of the things like a william does but probably in a little bit better of a way but i also know that it's not even though it, it's brought back to the january 6 uprisings and stuff like that and it's it's arisen to that I, I don't think that that link is as direct in many ways but i do think that it highlights the ways in which slavery and the ways that racism is allowed to persist and because of people not actually actively defending it and choosing to stand by their morals i think that that is an interesting thing and the fact that there is no main black characters because there was no one in the booth's family that they treated as an equal like the children do and they interact with the black children we see the experiences of them and the ways in which families being brought apart and being sold and the, the the just grief of like having their family house taken away from them with all the money that could save them the ways that that happens is really interesting but it is a backstory because the Booths treated it as a backstory. But I think that that also takes a little bit more development and analysis than some of the other themes, which are by Black authors and are dealing with it more directly. So I understand why it might not make the long list, but I really wish it did because I think it's just really good. And Glory, Glory, I feel like I've gone back and forth and back and forth because, yeah, I really did struggle in the beginning. And I, I did read i did watch a lot of reviews about it at three hours left and i think that that was such a great thing because i saw more more i saw more of the themes i saw more of the ways in which it employed and i also got to defend it i saw some reviews in which i disagreed with the things and i was able to be like no that's actually i don't agree with you here and it actually allowed me to articulate the things that i liked better like one of the ways that i liked it is the ways in which she discusses and uses metaphors like an example that i really liked was the ways in which she says that says their silence is like intestines which is something that is like so integral to their body something you cannot get out of the ways that it like it is something that is so essential to our lives and yet so not talked about and so kind of gross and i i really liked the ways that that did and maybe i'm overthinking it more than her but i enjoyed the ways in which i was able to discuss and defend the book and i think that actually made me like it better and i, I think that that's like a good reason why book prizes are so important and my book too is so great because when we get to be able to have these chances when we have them i think it allows us to have greater conversations on it and that is wonderful and then i read trust which is a book that i didn't think i was gonna like like i had no idea what it was really about and i was kind of nervous and i ended up really really enjoying it i'm so so glad i went in blind and didn't know anything and i got to be so intrigued i really liked the first half and i want a whole spoilery review on why that because i don't really want to spoil the aspects that were so surprising for me but i think that the reason why i like that is an interesting commentary and the third section is also really interesting and both of them deal a lot with how we tell our story who tells our story the roles in which women are situated in and presented is very intriguing and I kept on forgetting throughout this that like I kept on when thinking about the book referring to the authors as she just because that's that's pretty good like descriptive writing if a male author can present feminism and the experiences of being woman in a way that makes me forget that he's a guy and like one of the things is like she has a boyfriend and like he keeps on like coming over her and like touching her and stuff like that and being like you know helping her out or things like that and you can totally tell that in the, the the subtle movements is that he wants to have sex with her and he keeps on coming over and doing things because you know he wants to get laid and it's never said there is no moment in which we ever say he is doing this because he wants sex that is not ever stated but it is so very clearly that he has alternative motives in the way that he treats her and I really appreciated like those subtle movements on the like the just the being like really do I deal with this like I'm not worthy like it, it is very interesting in the ways that little things like that and and the ways in which statements that are said so emphatically are later counteracted and the ways that people present themselves versus the ways that other people present them and again it actually correlates similarly to booth where these characters are spouting all of these morals and then you see them and you're like 
that doesn't actually line up and I really love seeing those parallels in that. I think that Eric Anderson did such a great job of breaking these down and explaining these things and now I'm looking for all of them and I'm finding different ones. I think that Glory also has that aspect of people saying some things and not actually acting on them and that's an interesting way that propaganda is used, political is used, the ways that people don't say things and yeah, I just really loved it. And then Oh William. I, I haven't had as much time to process it and to listen to reviews and stuff like that. It is my favorite of her books so far. I think that it did a really good job of discussing and explaining things. And I love the fact that we have a mature protagonist. We have characters over the age of 50 in their 60s and 70s and exploring life and changing and the ways in which we have home, the ways we have identity, the dealing with a lot of poverty and the ways in which we leave poverty and self-image and parenting and ways we blame people. It is it is really interesting. I again don't think that it will be on the short list. It is intriguing but I wonder if it is the most important story on the list and I think that yeah like there's other books that deal with more intersections in more interesting ways but it is a book that I understand why Elizabeth Strout is a popular author and why her books resonate with people. I think that this did a better job. I, I like dramaticness. I like a little bit more poignancy. I've always been the person that people would complain about that I don't talk normally because I just I want to I want to say everything emotionally and kind of poetically like that's the kind of person I want so this everyday conversation I I know why it's effective but it's not my favorite in actuality and for me it is it is important I don't want to say it's not important but for me I think there's other books that I would rather see on the short list even if I haven't read them yet like after Sappho I'm really excited Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies I'm really excited for like these are books that I think are going to be really great I've also heard really great things of Colony I've heard really great things of The Trees I really want to read The Seven Moons of Mali Almeida I cannot read it it is not released in Canada until after the long list which makes me devastated so is after Sappho is not either and these make me really sad. Nightwalker, I'm very intrigued by. Like, I feel like I have to get in, like, a mental state for it before I read it, but I'm really excited for that one. So I hope so many of these make the long list because I want to see them and I want them to be available at my libraries even after the long list is announced and everything like that. I don't personally think Treacle is going to make it and I don't think... Throughout this entire vlog, I keep on forgetting to mention Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan, even though I read it, absolutely adored it, loved it. I would absolutely love to see it get the shortlist based on the things that I've heard from others, people's really positive reviews and stuff. I would be very surprised if Small Things Like These was not on the shortlist and I would absolutely love to see it there. And the last book that I do not have access for, I'm not sure where it will go, is Case Study. I was a little nervous about it because with the background in psychology and counseling, I never love when they're playing with that, but I saw a brilliant review by Fraser Simons on it and that made me really interested and intrigued. It plays with Rebecca and plays with the story of that and she kind of wants to focus on what Rebecca would do and the ways that you have this person and this other woman and how you're perceiving and all of that sounds super cool. It doesn't seem like the most favorite so I'm assuming it will be one of the ones that is discarded in the lawn list. I did not read every book off the lawn list last year but it's funny because I read three of the shortlist books and did not like any of them. I think they were all below two stars and the two long list books that I read that did not make it were both five stars for me. <laughs> so maybe I also am just not the best pick of the things and will be totally opposite from the books that I enjoyed but I really enjoyed diving deep into it and exploring them and thank you for coming along on this journey seeing me in my random states and things like that and I will see you next time. I plan on reacting to it and I hope that I will be surprised that I will be intrigued and I will have things to discuss.